What if I told you that we could protect our shorelines, save human lives, remove carbon from the atmosphere to slow down anthropogenic climate change, and help restore the natural environment by making coastal management decisions based on weather data that is stored at the bottom of the ocean? Well, I'm a paleoclimatologist. What it means is that I build unique data sets stored in oceanic sediment traps, like this blue hole that's behind me, to tell the story of how Earth's climate has changed over the last several thousand years. Learning about Earth's past can help us to understand how future climate change will impact the environment, which helps us to develop solutions to meet this threat head on. So today I'm gonna to tell you a three chapter story about understanding long-term hurricane risk. The first chapter starts out with defining our data problem that we have with our current climate data. In the second chapter, I will share how my colleagues and I are working tirelessly to build new data sets using climate records that are stored in sediments around the world. In the third chapter, I will discuss how we can actually use this data to inform actionable solutions to help triage and improve coastal resiliency efforts. So to start the story out, let's talk a bit about the current lack of long-term weather data and how it makes it difficult to grasp the scale of the climate crisis that we face. Now, the Earth is approximately 4.6 billion years old. In this time, we only have 170 years of observed weather data. This time frame is not even perceptible on this depiction of geologic time behind me. If we were to scale this to a 24-hour day, this would be less than three thousandths of one second. Can you predict how a day is going to go based on a moment that passes by faster than the blink of an eye? I can certainly say that 170 years is not long enough to fully grasp the complex relationships of ocean and climate variability on regional hurricane threats and flood risk. People's lives and environmental health depend on being able to forecast these hurricanes and the risk that they will pose, meaning that it's paramount that we find solutions to improve our long-term understanding of regional hurricane activity. This brings us to chapter two of my story, where I will share how my colleagues and I are working to find solutions to this climate data problem by studying mud and sand that's layered at the base of natural sediment traps, like flooded sinkholes that are known as blue holes, like we see in this slide. We're using these records to create regional hurricane susceptibility data sets that span thousands of years into the past. We call this paleo data. As we can see in this photo of the aftermath of Hurricane Ian in Florida, hurricanes cause strong storm surge and waves that transport massive quantities of sandy sediment and debris along the shore and into these natural sediment traps like blue holes. These sandy debris deposits are like hurricane fingerprints, and we see an example of one of them in the photo uh, on this slide. These hurricane fingerprints leave behind evidence of when and where major storms have occurred. Sediment records from natural time machines like blue holes give us a glimpse into the past so that we can better understand long-term trends in hurricane frequency and flooding potential. Fortunately, these natural time machines come in all shapes and sizes around the world, so we can readily scale this solution to create a database of paleo data across the world's shorelines. Now, we have overwhelming evidence that climate change driven by anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions is actually driving ocean surface warming. Ocean surface warming is driving an increase in the frequency of the most intense hurricanes and increasing rainfall potential from these storms. That said, what our paleo data from areas like the Bahamas, the Gulf of Mexico, the Yucatan Peninsula, and right here on the coast of New England are all telling us that regional hurricane risk is not a static feature over geological time. So this map behind me is a map of regional hurricane frequency that's based on in the North Atlantic that is based on the 170 year instrumental record of hurricane tracks that's currently available to us. Yellow and green areas are areas with lower hurricane frequency, whereas orange, red, and pink areas see progressively higher hurricane frequency. We can see that areas like the southern Yucatan Peninsula and the coast of New England have experienced relatively low hurricane frequency over the last 170 years. However, areas like the Outer Banks of North Carolina, the Northern Bahamas, and parts of the Gulf of Mexico have much higher hurricane frequency. What our paleo data reveals, though, is that these zones of risk are not consistent over longer time scales. For instance, the Bahamas and New England both experienced much higher hurricane frequency at times in the past when we saw ocean, warmer ocean currents along the eastern seaboard that were favorable for hurricane development and intensification. Simultaneously, we were also seeing lower hurricane frequency in areas like the Gulf of Mexico and the Yucatan Peninsula. 
So what this paleo data is telling us is that the instrumental record that we have may not always reflect long-term hurricane risk, as natural changes in ocean and climate conditions can cause some areas to be more favorable for hurricane development and other areas to be less favorable de for development. We also learned that long-term hurricane impact frequency in some regions, like the Bahamas, may actually be underestimated by this 170-year instrumental record. This data then suggests that some coastlines may be disproportionately impacted by more intense storms that are expected in the future. And we are not currently prepared for this threat. So one example of how we're using our paleo data to inform us about this. Our paleo data has helped to identify the Bahamas as an exceptionally high-risk shoreline over much of the last 1,500 years. The Bahamas is predicted to lose up to 12% of its total land area based on projections of up to a meter of sea level rise over the next century. And this is what we see in one, the left-hand panel on this map. On the right-hand panel, we show estimated inundation of Abaco Island in the Bahamas during Category 5 Hurricane Dorian in 2019. And what we can see is that many of the areas that were flooded by Dorian will already be underwater by 2100 due to sea level rise alone. This means that even weaker storms could produce catastrophic Dorian level flooding in some areas. So we must act now to help prepare these shorelines for this threat. This brings us to the final chapter of my story, which is where I will discuss how we can utilize paleo data to inform real world coastal resiliency and adaptation solutions. Now, Typically, when urban infrastructure like seawalls, homes, power lines, and bridges are developed, these structures are built to survive storms with similar intensity and impact frequency to what's been observed over the 170-year weather window. However, our paleo data is clearly demonstrating that we are underestimating the recurrence interval and the intensity of some of these storms in the past. This means we could be endangering lives and wasting billions of dollars because of this oversight. So what can we actually do about this? Well, classically, we've gone about protecting major metropolitan areas by installing concrete storm mitigation infrastructure like seawalls. And while these are sometimes a necessary evil, they can actually enhance erosion, destroy coastal environments, and, co and come with a very large carbon footprint that's needed just to get them developed. However, what we're seeing is that nature has developed eco-friendly solutions that may be actually be more efficient at mitigating storm impacts. Natural ecosystems like salt marshes, mangrove swamps, kelp and seagrass beds, and offshore invertebrate reefs like coral reefs and oyster reefs can provide important ecoservices that include storm surge mitigation, but also include water filtration, biodiversity enhancement, and even carbon dioxide capture from the atmosphere that will help to slow down the impacts of climate warming due to anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. For instance, studies after Superstorm Sandy in 2012 found that if oyster reefs off the New York coast could have dampened storm waves by as much as 200% if these populations were as healthy as they were prior to colonization and overfishing since the 1600s. Using these paleo data can help us to identify the most risk-prone shorelines so that we can select where to implement eco, where to focus eco-engineering efforts that can include things like installing substrates for oyster reefs and coral reefs and wetland restoration. In extreme cases, coastal retreat must be considered as continued sea level rise and more severe storm impacts in the future will make certain low-lying coastlines unviable for habitation. That said, I cannot stress enough that we cannot abide neocolonialism in the name of coastal mitigation measures. Many of the areas that are most susceptible to coastal flooding are inhabited <clears throat> by communities that are severely financially underprivileged. While it may be that some of this land does need to be requisitioned to be restored as wetlands, individuals who love the, live there must be well compensated and given the guidance to relocate to ensure that we are achieving true climate justice. That said, all coastal management and resiliency solutions must start with the best available data so that we're making informed decisions. And my colleagues and I are working to bring the insights from our natural time machines to the table for consideration. I'm therefore calling for scientists and policymakers to scale up the development and integration of paleo data so that we can improve our coastal resiliency decision making. Thank you.